hopefully that helps and makes it all very uh, much clearer for you guys. So now we're going to look at uh, comparing text and reading and responding. So your comparative essays and text response essays as well. Um, yeah, first considering uh, comparing text, it's going to be an analytical comparative essay based on two set texts. Um, they would have done this last year's here uh, as well. Hopefully it's not too difficult, just a bit of a revision. Um, and it's very similar to text response, which you've already done this year. Um, the requirement proposed by Vika, so it's not just you do, doing this, both texts have to have different forms, such as a novel and a movie, commonly a novel and a play. Um, I studied the seven stages of grieving and the longest memory when I was in school. That was a novel and a play. So the priorities to compare, it's all similarities and differences. Similarly to what you did now, there's a structure you can follow that looks pretty much exactly like this. We'll have a look where you discuss one text for a while, you bring in a comparative link, you discuss the other text for a while, you might mention some more comparisons and more compar comparative links, and you should, and then you contrast views and values at the end of your linking sentence. So that's probably already a really easy explanation. Um, but what's, what's the benefit of having different forms is that a lot of differences are going to arise from that just naturally. So just think about structural features and um, the limits that come from following a certain structure. Of course, there's going to be lots of differences um, between the texts that you can use. So, but the marks come from subtle similarities and differences, not obvious little things that are different. That's what we're aiming for. And of course, lots of comparison. So how do we prepare for this? How do we get to a good stage with this task and make this all easy for ourselves? First, you need to be able to understand the text in isolation by themselves, read the books and or other texts um, and have a good understanding of them, be able to interpret them and have strong ideas with regards to them. So great knowledge of characters, themes, views and values, structural devices, you want to use your notes, annotate on your book, accumulate quotes, do mini analyses, activities, group everything by themes in your book. Um, <clears throat> same as for text response, exactly the same. So this requires having a really sound and solid interpretation of the text um, in isolation, because without having a strong understanding, you will not be able to make strong comparative links. What can you compare? Um, of course, we've got our pyramid um, giving us lots of ideas. Structural features, very obvious, lots of comparative links to make here. Of course, if there are different genre texts, there's going to be a lot of structural features that are different. P possibly, though, this is not as valuable. Characters, um, there are often in these texts given to you to compare with each other characters that re represent and embody similar values, but there are certain differences in, in those characters, both in terms of personality and what they represent, and you can draw on this as well. Um, quite easy to do, lots of quotes for it, it's a pretty good idea. Now, what gets more difficult to do and more valuable, themes and views and values, so um, obviously drawing on key ideas within the text, the themes are likely similar, but they're represented slightly differently, and big picture ideas and overarching messages. What is the author trying to say? How is it different between the two texts? So when making comparative links, um, it's really similar to what we saw for analyzing argument. We've got lots of ideas, structural features, ideas, or message, structural features, ideas, or message. Again, opposites work well together. So a similarity in structural feature, but there's a, a different in the ideas or message relayed by that structural feature. Or there's a similar idea or, or message, but it's relayed differently by a different structural feature. So that's how you can make those links. Um, we're going to look in more detail at making these comparative links as well. Um, and really important note just to consider the similarities and the differences in offers views and values. You need to be constantly thinking about this when you're reading your comparative text constantly making notes on this, trying to accum accumulate a big bank of ideas. Because now all of your linking sentences in your intro, body paragraphs, in your conclusion, and even 
you know, your reason value statements within paragraphs, they will have to be of a comparative basis now. So every view and value that you think you see in one text, you need to be able to interpret in light of the other text. And we cannot juxtapose or put side by side entirely unrelated views. This is a really, uh, of course, far-fetched, but for example, if text A suggests that women deserve to be treated equally, while text B explores the consequences of tyrannical government. They have to be quite closely related. So my text B idea would still have to be about the women deserving to be treated equally. Uh, maybe text B says um, uh, that there are certain circumstances in which this does not apply, for example. That would be a subtle difference that is drawn from the same idea. Um, yeah, so question, literally ask yourself, what is a common thing between these texts and how does the exploration of this idea intersect so it's the same, it meets together, or it differs? For example, the theme of power could be common between your texts. You might ask, how do the authors pre present those with power, those without it, in a good way or in a bad way? How is the power achieved and maintained? And what are the ultimate messages regarding power as a consequence of these other, you know, two questions that we've asked and their answers. So you can view everything like a Venn diagram. Everything is related. One theme in each text, a lot of it's going to be similar in the other text. What is different? What is on the outskirts? What's the overlap? Because we need the similarities as well. And what's the difference? So when you start studying comparative text responses, it's really good to, if you haven't been already doing it this year, start taking notes and taking it a bit more seriously because the task can be hard. It can be hard for students to score highly some of the time on comparatives. <laughs> it's quite substantially longer usually in terms of essay length a lot of the time. So we can also, of course, we said, but we can compare structural devices. Um, noting that the text might say relay similar ideas and thoughts, but there might be differences in how they say it. And that could be due to conventions of, of their genre um, or even things like characterization and what qualities they've set for certain characters, the structure of the text and um, things that, you know, are structural, but outside of genre conventions, things like symbolism and use of metaphor as well. So the same structural feature can contribute to different themes or messages between the texts, and different structural features may be used in support of the same theme or message. And this is something I would put in your notes, that idea of we can make um, links based on structural devices, either to uh, their similar structural features, but there is a different theme or message, or there's the same theme or message, but it's expressed in different structural devices, in the two texts. Um, very um, important thing to hold on to because it really does apply to most texts in English. Uh, and some more detail for structural features and things that re relate to genre conventions. Um, so you can see that list there, we won't go over, but the idea is to always aim for text specific structural features. So for example, if you're studying a film, you need to use as evidence film techniques, even aiming for a balance of 50-50, just normal quotes and um, and um, versus film techniques and analyzing those. So this might be a handy list for, for you, depending on what you're studying. And of course, similarities, we still need them. They're not as valuable, so we limit how many we have, not too many. Um, and try to refer back to subtle differences as much as possible. Um, the smaller, the better, the more difficult to spot, the, the more valuable in your comparative essays. So how do we structure it? So introductions should address the prompt and outline your contention. Same thing as text response, except your contention will have the arguments of both the authors. Um, all the same thing, you know, you're introducing kind of the context of the prompt and the two texts and their titles. You're uh, going into a contention that puts together both, uh, both the author's uh, arguments. Um, and you can even end, end with a views and values message that might already incorporate a difference or 
similarity or hopefully both um, before you go into your body paragraphs. So optionally, you can incorporate relevant contextual or historical information. Just a little bit can be good to show off your knowledge of your text, not too much. Um, briefly outlining your main sub arguments without evidence um, and some things to definitely avoid. Um, now, I've, I'm going to just chat about this point, uh, outlining sub arguments without evidence. I feel as though this is too um, long and convoluted to do in, um, uh, in, in a comparative essay and it detracts from the flow of the writing and I really don't recommend it. Um, you can still kind of, this, this is very valid. So what you can do instead is um, state your contention and elaborate on that. So, you know, you can have a two sentence contention almost for you can state how the arguments are similar between the texts in response to the prompt and how they are different. Just detail it a bit more, just expand on it almost like you would with arguments, except you're not trying to cover everything that your sub arguments are about. Um, but you do need the, um, still it's a prompt, you do need your rebuttal idea. So just like text response, we know we need one argument, one body paragraph showcasing the opposite point of view. Do mention that as well as part of your contention. So that's just kind of my recommendation to you. Um, avoid retelling the story, memorizing anything ever. <laughs> um, don't do that. <laughs> um, mem memorize a structure you can use to write body paragraphs, but never mem memorize anything to actually write down. Um, obvious signposts, of course, um, and like firstly, secondly, for arguments, a bit silly. Just, uh, you know, you'll be using probably a, a lot of whereas, however, on the other hand, similarly, if you feel like you don't have enough uh, distinguishing words um, or comparing words, I would make a vocab list in my notes to make sure you have enough and you don't keep using the same words. Specific differences and specific <coughs> similarities, of course, to stay away from. So we can see an example of an introduction. That morning, I faced the world for the time as a nobody, nameless. And you will notice a lot of comparative prompts will have quotes in them. If a quote is included in the prompt, you need to analyze it somewhere, you know, in your body paragraphs. Several quotes included, like these two, need to try to analyze both of them somewhere. Don't just disregard them. And um, also, don't choose the prompt if you don't understand where the quotes are from and what they mean. Okay, so you need to be able to interpret the quotes that are in your prompt in order to be able to sufficiently address the prompt, write an essay that is good, answers the question, gets you high marks. So this one says, compare what the two texts say about the importance of names. We can see context introduction, introduction and introduce, introduction of the two texts. Expressions of a dominant white narrative have all often been used to suppress the growth of black culture following grave tragedies, such as the colonization of Australia's first peoples and the transatlantic slave trade. Impressive contextual introduction, you want to have something like that as well. If there is anything that you can sort of memorize, it's not entire sentences, but your contextual information you should have and you should have memorized some ideas to write about. Um, here are our uh, contentions. In Tom Wright's didactic play, Black Figures, and Fred Diagor's neo-slave novella have the genres um, and the text types attached next to the title of the text need to have that. Um, remember also offers full names. Um, later on you will refer to them just by their last name. <laughs> Both writers reveal a powerful belief system that profits from the quashing of black names and identities through the perpetuation of racist ideals. This is our contention as this is how with regards to the importance of names these two texts are similar. Next we see structure around a multiplicity of voices. The texts capture various individual responses to societal control of their identity. Um, ultimately, however, through demonstrating no overhaul of the values which govern racism, both writers demonstrate that in continual white dictatorship of black identities, individuals <coughs> will continue to suffer. So you see that views and values message that has been drawn from both texts. Um, and it was, uh, we did elaborate on the contention. We talked about, um, individual responses to societal control of identity, how it focuses on the lives of the, all the different people in the text.
and there are different responses. So this is a great example of an intro. We see that that was the context sentence. Argument one, listing other arguments, but that was, uh, third one was linked in with views and values as well. Um, and this is um, intended to be a rebuttal as well, um, because it's about the meaningful overhaul of the values that govern racism. Don't forget that we need a semi-rebuttal. So how do you use structure? Now, this is the structure that I recommend um, and the best structure, in my opinion, you can see this is exactly what we were doing in um, looking at the comparative analyzing argument. An, arg uh, an, an argument or topic sentence established around a similarity in both the texts in terms of argument, discussing your first text for a while, this could be text one or two, doesn't really matter, discussing one text for a while, making a link, hopefully based on differences or both a similarity and a difference, most valuable, then discussing text two for a while, then a transition between uh, both ideas um, to bring in potentially a, a new sub idea. And again, discuss one text, link, discuss the other text, and then a comparison wrapping up the paragraph, your linking sentence of views and values. So this, what I've just shown you, I like that photograph better, so I've put that on, is the switch method. And there is also something called the rainbow method, which we will have a, ch the ch a chat about in a bit. You can see it just switches between text A, text B, text A, text B, text B constantly. So we see the switch method uh, being uh, here. It's a bit, um, we won't look at it too long because it's very long, but have a look on, on your own slides as well attached to the lesson, but um, just the discussion. So see how the argument is based around a similarity in the argument. Both Wright and Diagora explore how deeply cemented social values of racial superiority facilitates and encourages a willful ignorance of the inhumanity of racism. So a topic sentence based on a similar argument in both texts in relation to the problem. Then we discuss one text. In this case, the longest memory was discussed, you know, one, two pieces of evidence and analyze them. Bring in a comparative link where Diagora deliberates the personal financial motivations and social pressures to demean slaves. Wright instead lends his focus to the institution of justice and its role in legally sanctifying the denial of full citizenship privileges. So subtle nuance. Um, what are the subtle ways in, in terms of how uh, these slaves were being mistreated? Um, and um, we can see that beautiful sentence structure that you can also take um, example of. Other text was discussed for a while again. Um, again, lengths can vary, vary which text you want to discuss more. It's not a big deal. And then wrapping up uh, a comparative style sentence, a uh, linking sentence in terms of views and values based on what you've discussed, compared, comparing views and values messages. As such, Wright and Diago are both resolved that it's a, a combination of institutionalized racism and society's willingness to represent it that results in the indignity of the oppressed races. In this case, it was done based on a similarity. Um, so you, you'll still unavoidably have similarities every once in a while, but just differences are more valuable. So this web switch method is very nice and easy to use and switch between from and does not make the uh, comparative aspect of the task so tiresome and difficult to do. It also helps you to save on how much you have to write. You don't have to constantly use comparative words um, and um, it really makes it easier to use it. You can make it still feel a lot more like a text response task to yourself rather than a full-blown comparative task. This is my preferred method. It is easier. Whenever I see rainbow method essays being done, I never really see it done well in a non-messy way. Um, and this ensures that everything is analyzed in depthly um, for all of your essays. And we know a significant amount of your marks comes from analysis. So I really recommend sticking to this structure. Um, of course, you've got less frequent comparisons with the switch method, <clears throat> but we see that's not a problem. And the amount of comparison was very significant still. It is a good amount of comparison if you do it properly, if you can make strong comparative links, <coughs> something to practice for. Now with the uh, rainbow method, we see that still, you know, 
you're going to introduce your argument based on a similarity in both texts. It's really the only way. Now, texts will not be um, uh, discussed for a very long time. So you see, one text was discussed for a little bit, already bringing in a comparative link. Similarly, Whitechapel in the other text is so grieved by his memory of throwing my son to the lions that he tries to deny it by also surrendering his identity, choosing to become nameless. <clears throat> so instead of bringing in a transition link directly going on from what was discussed about the other text, we instantly make a comparison. This, this can require quite a bit of planning so it doesn't become messy. You really need to think out where you're going to bring in from what piece of evidence can you jump into similarity or difference and for it to still be meaningful. So this is not um, easy. Um, <clears throat> and then more comparison. Um, so see how little we discussed um, the similarity in the longest memory, um, making it quite unequal so far. It's just one sentence and shallow analysis. Um, so don't particularly recommend the rainbow method. Again, it's comparing more both texts now. So it's making a lot more comparative links with this method, but it's difficult to, to pull off the structure well. Um, but actually, you know, if, if for, for, for students that are really good at English, it's quite, quite, quite easy to potentially just adopt this structure and do it well. Otherwise, um, either structure that you choose, if you do it well, you will not uh, be disadvantaged or lose any marks. Um, so we see the same thing. Very short analysis of each text. Um, always when something is analyzed from one text, a similarity or difference is brought in. We see that in pink, in the same way Whitechapel wears his memory. Then keeps going with comparative links. You see that this does not analyze the text in depthly. There's lots of discussion around similarity and differences. There's not much evidence and actual analysis of the evidence in the two texts. So it's got limited depth for the individual text. It's hard to plan for and it can very easily turn messy. However, it does compare a lot. Um, if done well, it can be really impressive. Consider being able to write under time pressures because for you to pull it off and have enough evidence analysis, you need to write very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, um, that's, that's just something to consider, like um, balancing the comparison with the analysis. Rainbow method takes skill, with the switch method, with uh, with just understanding the structure, you can pretty much achieve it right away. But those are the two main comparative structures used in English. So lastly, we'll cover text response for the remainder of our session. So feel free as we go along to pick a prompt from these two pages on the slides based on one of the texts that you're studying and go along. We'll go through um, in detail how do you break down a prompt, how do you plan for it, and end up writing a strong essay. Cannot disregard the importance of planning. Without planning, cannot have a good, uh, strong essay. Planning is crucial. And the more you practice it, the more efficient and effective you'll get that planning will take you a very short time, you know, even for a really great plan, which is what we want for the exam where we only have, you know, one hour per section. So this is the prompt that we'll have a look at. Wuthering Heights is a novel that revels in chaos and turbulence. So of course, what do we need to do first? We need to break down this prompt, define all of the keywords for themselves, uh, for ourselves, because they are the ones we will have to address in our body paragraphs. We can't miss any of the keywords in order to be fully answering the prompt. So revels, chaos and turbulence. Um, and this shows you the importance of bringing in a dictionary to the exam because you might view some words as synonymous and not be able to tell the difference between them. But if you treat them as one and analyze them together, you'll actually lose marks because the concept of the task is you do have to analyze them and treat them as separate. So rev revels, when something revels in something, it cel celebrates or endorses it. So we're saying that Bronte, um, the author of the novel, is potentially, according to this prompt, creating this chaotic and turbulent environment because she likes chaos and wants to reinforce it. So revels, chaos, we know is when things are confusing and in disarray. 
And turbulence means when things are constantly changing or fluctuating, they're not stable, they can't be controlled. So chaos and turbulence are very different. Chaos, things are going wrong, um, disorder, turbulence, things are moving along quickly and always changing all the time. Um, then you need to question the prompt, ask questions that will help you to come up with uh, topic sentences in with based on the ideas you come up uh, to the questions you've raised. Find all the ways to challenge the prompt. And this will also help you to decide on your position. Do you agree or disagree? So questioning, does it celebrate the chaos? Are there times where the disturbance is commiserated? Is it a bad thing sometimes? Um, are there moments where the novel is not chaotic or turbulent and something else is pervading the text, for example? And of course, many more ask questions of your uh, prompt. However, make sure that you are asking questions about each keyword. You cannot just disregard one. So when we choose a position, you're year 12, so you hopefully know this, we cannot be neutral and we cannot completely disagree. We cannot com completely agree. We need to be where these smiley faces are because we need one paragraph of the opposite point of view. So if I chose I more disagree, right, then I might have two body paragraphs on disagreeing arguments with the prompt and one on agreeing. One paragraph is crucial of um, opposite point of view. That's why we can't choose neutral, okay? So we don't have an opinion if we choose neutral. We would cover each argument equally and we never answered the prompt. We didn't have a strong interpretation. If we completely disagree or completely agree, there's no room for a rebuttal, uh, you know, that rebuttal showing the opposite point of view. And there is always, in every open-ended English prompt that you get, there are always both points of view. You could argue for either, you could write a complete essay for either. That's why I guess you're required also to have that uh, paragraph to be able to show that you can interpret it from the other way, the other perspective as well. So um, amazing. So once you've chosen your position, you write down ideas for your topic sentences. And they're just ideas. They're not arguments yet. They need to be converted into their proper form. And these ideas can include everything that helps you, character names, the things that you want to discuss for that argument, and then you turn it into an argument. So next step is where they become topic sentences. So at least one of these has to challenge the prompt. So in this case, we've got four. Catherine and Heathcliff's love is chaotic. So this is where we see that reveling in the chaos. Um, number two, even harmless and moral characters such as Isabella can be violent and turbulent. So we're saying that there's no black and white. Everything is always turbulent. No one, uh, everything is dynamic. No one is stable and remains in the same state. Things affect people when things happen. No one is just good or bad. Um, that's what Bronte is trying to relate. Supernatural elements create turbulence. Um, that's referring to environmental uh, impact on, on chaos and turbulence. Not everything is within people's control that, that people can control. And chaos goes away at the end of the book because of Kathy and Harrison, new generation come in. So we see that there are prospects for a good, calm sort of future. So now these are just ideas and they are character based. They have character names in them. We cannot have character names in topic sentence, absolutely forbidden. <laughs> um, so we need to convert them into actual arguments um, that address the prompt and address every word that's in the prompt as well. Um, making, uh, making sure we have a rebuttal in there. So never list characters in your topic sentences because they are simply the embodiment of ideas. They are not arguments in themselves. They are your evidence. Um, and never list evidence that you are going to analyze right after. You may only use quotes for a stylistic effect from the text if you would like, but if you're putting <coughs> quotes into your argument for the intention that your next sentence you're gonna jump right in to analyze them, that's not a good idea. So stay away from that. Um, yep, yeah, everything should be based on your ideas. So we take the characters' names out. For example, Bronte demonstrates how love and hate can be inextricably intertwined, making it difficult for readers to ascertain between the two. 
So we established that their love was chaotic, which means that um, they're both strong emotions and with love comes hate. That's what Bronte is trying to say. It's difficult to tell them apart because um, usually when one's present, so is the other. And there we go. We've turned that into an argument. Let's see the next one. Um, Bronte's characters subvert or challenge conventional boundaries of good and evil, thus revealing how there could be no definitive sense of morality. So that concept of there's no black and white, there's no good and evil, even characters that seem innocuous or innocent um, do not end up being necessarily being so. Ghost create turbulence, the fantastic occurrences of the novel demonstrate how the boundaries between real and unreal are, are blurred um, and are um, counter argument. Nonetheless, Bronte promises her readers with a sense of harmony through the careful blend of characters of her future generation. <laughs> kind of discussed before we looked at it, but hopefully it all makes sense. So of course, what do we do next? We need to have our arguments before we write our contention and we need our contention to start writing. So how do our all of our points come together in a clear and concise way? If you're agreeing with the prompt, you just need a short detail about how, yes, you know, this chaos and turbulence exists. And then the second half of your contention needs to include your rebuttal idea. And we know in a typical text response introduction as well, you have to do either or, either have that short, concise contention and elaborate on it, or literally quickly kind of list mention all of your arguments, signpost all of your arguments in your intro after your contention. So you still need to have a contention either way. Um, but try to make it clear and concise and make sure it takes into account and completely relates to what you said in your topic sentences and that it has your counter argument. So here we have thus, Bronte ultimately suggests that despite the chaos and turbulence of the past, order can still be restored to ensure that love prevails. So that second half of the sentence establishes our counter argument. Um, as part of planning as well, we need to no point any quotes and evidence that you're going to use. You can also no point analysis. If you can do this in your head, that's fine. You can skip this part. It can be really difficult. Uh, it can be really helpful if you find um, planning a little bit challenging or you just want to double check that you have strong enough analytical ideas so that you don't have to change your argument into something else. Because sometimes students find that, oh, I actually don't have enough to write on this or I don't have enough ideas. So really important to plan. At least note your quotes down in very short quotes, right? Um, and think about them in your head. How would you analyze them? Does that make for a strong point paragraph? So let's see. Um, we have the quotes, I'm Heathcliff. Kathy describes the union as of little visible delight but necessary between her and Heathcliff and one that degrades her. And Heathcliff tells Kathy that she is his murderer and Kathy tells H, you have killed me. Let's see that analysis. Um, I'm Heathcliff. B reveals that they construct identities in terms of each other, like mimicking each other because of their close relationship. Um, and Kathy, this, uh, the, the second quote demonstrates how their relationship is manifested by their need of each other, perceived need of each other or reliance as opposed to actual love. We're kind of saying that maybe they do hate each other more than love each other. Um, and the last one is where Bronte elucidates how the lovers are gripped by a romantic rivalry that is almost sadistically sadistic, ultimately showing how toxic and chaotic their relationship is, damaging both of them. So you want to also have the same thing in your body paragraphs, and this is why you want to plan, where each quote is, you know, better than the last. They're kind of building on each other. We start with something simple, like I'm, the I'm Heathcliff quote, and it's got a more simple analytical idea. And then it kind of evolves and evolves and evolves until in your linking sentence, you're able to make that valuable views and values analysis based on everything you've discussed. And it's a really great one. <clears throat> so something to practice if you haven't been doing that. Um, also take note of any structural features that you are also going to analyze. For example, film, filmic techniques. We know we have to do this. We cannot just have quotes. Aim for at least one to two. If it's just a novel, you know, still have symbols, metaphors, maybe have something interesting like a non-linear narrative structure. Um, try to include uh, something, not just rely on some quotes. Each paragraph should have some, some, some structural feature. 
especially relevant to the genre. Um, so for example, we have Kathy's Ghost Haunts Heathcliff as a symbol. It symbolizes the transcendent nature of love and willingness to also torment him after that, oh, after death, also going off that love and hate intertwined idea, because although love continues <clears throat> after individuals have passed away, it's transcended, um, so does hatred, and Kathy wants to haunt Heathcliff, um, therefore acting as a symbol of that dual, dual, dual nature of their love. And Heathcliff and Kathy's ghost roaming of moors is a metaphorical rejection of heaven or hell. We talked about how Bronte says there's no black and white. Everyone's in this sort of state of gray. <clears throat> All right. So, and then we, t we talked about views and values. And this is happens. You need to do this in your linking sentence at the end of your each, each paragraph. Draw a views and values or a for your intent message. Um, but you need to also do that at least once elsewhere per body paragraph um, so that you have more in-depth analysis. So always, if you see the opportunity to analyze something further, not just zoom in into, okay, what does this piece of evidence say about the character? Um, really like closely zooming in or what, are the, what do those words actually mean? What's their symbolic meaning? You also, when you see the opportunity, zoom out and analyze in depth, zoom out into your for your intent and views and values in another sense. So do that at least one at a time outside of your linking sentence, wrapping up the body paragraph, just at least once more. So we see that being done with this symbol of the ghost. Bronte's view is uh, she spouses how the finiteness of human nature or how humans always die um, can result in yearning for an internal reality where people can become their complete selves. Um, and here we're talking about how disability, you know, this ability that we can become a ghost um, um, that comes out of fear of, of, of dying and wanting to live on forever. People cannot move on even after death. Um, and of course, need our concluding sentences <coughs> for our body paragraphs, stating what, again, views and values, ultimate view of the author is in relation to that argument. So you reflect back on your topic sentence and you draw an idea based on everything you've discussed and analyzed through that body paragraph. That's acting as your justification. You don't need to justify anything because you already analyzed all this evidence. So if we look at just a couple uh, examples for the love and hate argument, Bronte thus conveys that an inability to look beyond, uh, beyond one's own needs and feelings is what can characterize romantic relationships as tumultuous, so an unstable synonym for turbulent and harmful um and uh <laughs> the idea that everyone has an ego and sense of self and ego comes with that and they cannot just take that away and give everything to a person and both people have a selfish need resulting in chaotic relationships for example um so have a look at, at these other um um concluding sentences if you'd like, especially if you find uh, you find difficult to write strong views and value statements. This can really help you and give you some ideas. And then when we write a conclusion, because we looked at introductions in a nutshell and we, we spoke about body paragraphs, we need to summarize, restate your contention in different words, elaborate on it, detail it much more than it's in your introduction, and end on an impactful views and statement if this is your best one that you can think of yet. That would be great. You might have kept the best idea for last. And if you're struggling, running out of ideas on what to finish on, maybe draw from that uh, counter argument that you had. Because even though you've discussed all the things that you know either were agreeing or disagreeing with the prompt, you might think find that there are things with regards to your counter argument views and values ideas that you haven't used. So that's a handy tip if if you're thinking, oh, I don't know how to impactfully finish don't just look at your main arguments look at your counter argument also so that's been done in this example if we have a look in essence bronte provides readers with a world that is plagued by ambiguity um, or uncertainty the boundaries between love and hate the good and evil and the real and unreal are blurred and the subversion or challenging of such boundaries encompasses the chaos and turbulence of wuthering heights see that beautifully uh, elaborated on contention, going into a lot of detail, summarizing the text as a whole almost in response to the prompt. Um, 
And then that rebuttal argument is included as well, that counter argument. It is only the love of the following generation that possesses a promise of certainty and allows for the novel to reach emotional completion. And the views and values message drawn from the counter argument. In consequence, Bronte extols feeling and living in moderation and respecting the humanity of others uh, to allow for a harmonious and peaceful life. Beautiful, hope that helps. Um, now, hopefully you've just been asking questions as we kind of going al along in the chat. I'm sure that I'm busy answering your questions anyway, but um, I feel like I've shared a lot of tips as I go along. Probably the only thing that um, I would kind of like to address is um, you need to read or watch your text as long as it takes you until you feel you have you are confident you have a solid interpretation. And if that means you need to go online, read some analytical summaries of your text, do some further research to be a bit more efficient rather than just rereading your book uh, novel without any specific aim, I absolutely recommend that. What I used to do in um, year 12 is sit down with my text, go through, skim through the entire book that I've like already read, highlight all the quotes I found significant, and then group a notebook into different themes and ideas and structural features as well. So different sections for the same text. And um, those subsections would get their own quotes and structural devices from what I've annotated. And I would write mini analyses um, as well. So kind of what you would literally do in an essay, a mini analysis um, of that piece of evidence. That helped me. I did not have to memorize any quotes for the exam. I did not have to uh, <clears throat> basically like study because I studied throughout the year. Um, it's not too late to do that as well. I studied throughout the year and I just read that notebook very, very, very often to prevent having to, to stress and, and really work very hard to get to like uh, a good a good level where you felt really um, that you were going to do really well. So is, essentially the main <laughs> the main um, suggestion that I have is get on top of it early. So it's not as stressful. You, it's not so time consuming and you kind of just move past it. Do more work now so that you don't have to do more work later. Um, and every all of you guys, I'm sure will be fine. Um, don't put too much pressure on yourself. A lot of people are stressed about the English exam. Um, you'll be completely fine. Just do some practice uh, and timed essays every once in a while, maybe once a week for different uh, di different sections A to C. Um, only takes an hour of your time. And if you can't be bothered writing essays, you can even try writing little sections like body paragraphs, say timed 15 minutes, mini, anal mini analytical activities, planning activities to plan for an entire essay and things like that. All of them very beneficial use of your time. 